for the beats. Yeah, yeah. Sweet. Almost everything. Is that right, Miley? Um, the leg of it. Yeah. Sweet. Nice. Alright, mm. let's do it. Uh, so no music this time, otherwise we get uh, censored by uh, YouTube in some countries. So uh, we'll figure out how to do that, we'll probably start playing some of our own music next time. But uh, welcome to this uh, Q&A session with uh, Manual Brewing in Focus. It's going to be a little bit more basic this time than previous time. Uh, just because I want to help people brew better coffee. It doesn't really matter what level you're at, I think you'll uh, probably agree with some of my opinions here, but um, uh, it's also something to take home and play with, uh, I think. Uh, manual brewing is very simple, um, you just need really good coffee. Today we're going to brew uh, one of my favorites at the moment, Finca Tamala from Colombia, because uh, it's still tasting really fresh, although it was harvested in, in July last year. Um, and also uh, one of my favorite coffees from one of my favorite producers uh, from the Finca Nascimento in Honduras. Uh, the producer is Hovnir Caceres Dios and uh, he is in Santa Barbara in Honduras. And this is a Pacas variety. This is also harvested last year, possibly getting a little tired, uh, but still tasting really vibrant in the acidity and, and some fruits. If you want to learn about manual brewing, I really suggest that you you, you start with just one or two coffees. Don't go crazy with brewing 10 different coffees at the same time. It's better to use the same coffee with the same roast and then play with the different um, factors that will affect the cup. And we're gonna, we're gonna go through those a little bit. Um, because there are uh, a lot of focus, uh, there is a lot of focus on the small details of brewing and improving the, the actual brew. But uh, uh, in my opinion, uh, you can only improve the cup that much, if, at least if you know, uh, you know, um, the basics of brewing. That you can only improve the, the the cup quality that much. I believe that you can improve the cup quality much, much more with roasting and, and growing. And especially on the farm side, we see that, uh, well, I see that most of the farmers uh, are still learning a lot in terms of improving the quality. So. To make a good cup of coffee, obviously you need good ingredients, so buy one of your favorite coffees, try to buy the same uh, roast batch and buy like a kilo of it maybe, and then you can start playing around with different variables when you when you play with the brewing, such as the water temperature, the grind size and so on. Um, so I recommend you to, to start with one and then once you sort of feel that you are uh, mastering the, the different varietals in, in brewing, then you can start uh, playing with other coffees and then it's much easier to see what you actually have to do in order to improve the flavor of that coffee. Uh, normally I, when I get a new coffee I always cup it first. Uh, it's always a good thing to, to cup taste and cup tasting I normally do in a cup like this. I'll just grind uh, 11 grams in this, uh, of coffee in this cup. It's kind of a, kind of a fine grind. If you don't have a refractometer then maybe like a filter grind or something and then you pour hot water on and let it steep for 4 minutes. So I have 11 grams to 180 grams of water. 11 grams of coffee, 180 grams of water. And you stir in the top of it uh, 3 times, let the ground sink to the bottom, you skim the foam on top, wait another 10 to 15 minutes and then you taste it with a spoon. Um, I feel that this kind of brewing is always giving you the most honest cup. Um, so. And it's, it's my way, it's, it's the way I prefer to actually drink coffee. So a lot of times I would just make a cupping cup and stir it and wait for the grounds to sit on the bottom and then I'll just pour it into another cup and then drink it. So that's sort of my benchmark for how the coffee, coffee's potential is. And that's the potential that I want into my brewed cup, whether it's brewed with a Hario V60, which I use a lot or whether it's brewed with an air press, or whether it's brewed with a French press or a siphon. Uh, I strongly believe that the, the brews should taste very similar. Of course, some of the brews, like a Chemex, you will taste a little bit more paper filter. Uh, maybe a siphon, it will taste a dirty cotton filter if you haven't cleaned that. So, um, but the potential in the coffee is the same because you're using the same beans. So 
if you know the potential, then you know what to look for when you, you start brewing with your, your own device. A lot of pe people ask me what's the difference between a V60 and a Chemex and, and a Kalita, for instance. Well, the obvious difference is the shape, of course, um, but also the, the paper filters that come with the brewer are, can have different micron size, so you will have to adjust the grind particle size coarser, for example, for a Chemex than for a, for a V60. Um, the more paper you have, the more you need to rinse it because the paper really tastes papery and that affects the brew as well. So you want, want some cleanliness in the cup, you need to rinse the paper. Um, Alright, so ingredients is key of course. Make sure you have fresh coffee. That doesn't mean that it's not harvested last year. Like this tamana, I just cut it through uh, next to the fresh crop that we just arrived. And um, couldn't really taste a huge difference in terms of age of the coffee. So freshness is relative. It's, it depends on how the coffee is produced and dried and so on. But just make sure you have a vibrant and a fresh tasting coffee. Um, that's very important. And also the roast. It should be a roast that you prefer. Uh, you might not like my light roast style because it's uh, bright and acidic and so on. But uh, try not to go too dark because you're, not, you're never going to get the full potential in the cup anyway. It's just going to taste very bitter and, and, and burnt. So try, to, try a little bit lighter roast, that's my recommendation. Alright, so that's the ingredients. Water, of course. Uh, we'll put a link out uh, to some videos that you need to see if you're interested in learning about water and how water affects coffee, because it does a lot. Uh, I'm working with the restaurant Noma in Denmark and they have tons of calcium and uh, bicarbonate in their water mm -hmm. as compared to my water here in Oslo and my coffee tastes completely different. So you need to really filter the water. Uh, there we, we're using uh, reverse osmosis, so we're removing most of the minerals in order to get the coffee to taste acidic and vibrant. Um, you have some calcium and bicarbonates that will just kill the acidity in the coffee, for instance. So if you want to learn more about the uh, water chemistry, I really recommend that you watch Maxwell Colonna's uh, lectures on, that are available online. I think they're on YouTube. Uh, there are a couple of them. Um, and also look at his page, uh, Colonna and Smalls is his store. Uh, he really knows uh, the shit about coffee. So uh, no, about water and also coffee. So I highly recommend you to, to research that. Um, we'll put a link out, uh, right Mats? Yeah. Yeah, we'll put a link out. All right, so that's the ingredients, water and coffee. Um, so we're using two ingredients, water and coffee, and possibly a third one, which is a filter, like a paper filter or a cotton filter. And I look upon that as an ingredient as well, because it, you can affect the flavor with it. Uh, for instance, if you're using Brown filter, they normally taste a little bit more papery than the white ones, so I recommend using white ones. They're more neutral in, in taste. If you wonder how your paper filter tastes like, just soak them in water and, and then taste the water afterwards and you'll see how the paper filter affects the flavor of the coffee. Alright, if you're a professional or a semi-professional or an enthusiast, I highly recommend getting a refractometer. Uh, you'll learn much more about brewing by using this regularly than you will of any book you can read. Uh, I use it all the time to check my brews, to check my grind size, to check if my coffees are fully developed in, in terms of roasting and so on. Uh, I'll show you a little bit how it works afterwards, but this has been the best tool that I've ever bought for myself and I, this has also been the tool that I've learned the most of by using in my everyday life when I brew coffee. So I normally check every brew that I uh, do, especially here in the store. Uh, and yeah, it turns your uh, old theories a little bit around, but uh, it's very, very useful and uh, it's super easy as well. It's a little expensive, but look at the knowledge you'll get instead of the expense. That was our refractometer. Refractometer, yeah. yeah, yeah. And, uh, you go to the VST app store, uh, he's the one who is selling them, uh, super, super equipment. Quite expensive, but again, look at what you can learn, not the expense. Uh, Alright, so that's the refractometer, that's the ingredients. Uh, one of the things that I noticed uh, during the World Championship of Aeropress Brewing this year, and also the Norwegian Championship, was that some of you were brewing, uh, I'm just assuming that some of you who competed are watching, uh, some of them were competing with dirty equipment and you can really taste that sort of rancid coffee oil very easily if you don't clean your equipment well. So 
After every use, I highly recommend cleaning it with a brush, a little bit of detergent and hot water so it's ready for next use. Otherwise, you'll get the rancid coffee taste in your brew and that's not very nice. Um, of course, if you're brewing like 10 brews after each other, you can just rinse it with water. But once the brewing device is uh, standing or sitting around for a couple of hours, I highly recommend uh, cleaning it in between. Um, I'm going to start by brewing the AeroPress. A lot of people ask me how I brew AeroPress, and I'll tell you how I brew it. Um, the way we do it in the store, which is with uh, the paper filter that comes with it. Um, the reason why we use paper filter here is because it's just an easier routine to, to get rid of the grounds and the filter, and, and the cleaning routine is a little bit more efficient. On a Saturday, we'll typically brew between 150 and 200 AeroPress in five hours, so its uh, speed is very important for us. So we fix the filter in the AeroPress, close the AeroPress. I normally rinse it with a little bit of water and also to preheat the AeroPress a little bit. So this is pre-boiled water. Just pour some through. And then the brew ratio that we do in our store is 14 grams of coffee to 200 grams of water. That's a kind of a high dose, it's 70 grams per liter. And the reason why we do this is because this is a full immersion brewing method. That means the coffee and the water is together all the time, and then you sort of press the coffee through a filter. Mm -hmm. It's the same as a French press uh, and also a siphon. Uh, if you're using a drip method, that means you're actually by gravity pouring water through the coffee and the, the, the liquid is going out so not all of the liquid will be together with the coffee. So you need to adjust your dose a little bit accordingly. So we normally use less coffee for a drip method and a little bit more coffee for a full immersion method. And that's because some of the water is retained in the grounds afterwards and the strength is the same there as in the brew whereas at the drip the strength of the water retained in the grounds is much lower than what you're actually getting out in your in your uh, in your jug or whatever you're brewing in. So now the water has run through, pour it out, just shake off the, the excess water and I pre-measured uh, 14 grams of coffee, we're gonna use the tamala this time and a lot of people ask me how to grind for AeroPress, well it really depends on your grind time uh, no, sorry, the brewing time, and also um, how much you stir, because agitation or turbulence will affect the brewing a lot more than the time. So we we do quite a fine grind. We use the EK on our EK. We grind on ten on the dial, but this is a dial that I got from Colin Harmon, so it's not the original dial. I'll have a little look. It will probably be around six and a half on the original dial on the EK. All right, so let's fix this. Uh, which paper filter do you use? The paper filter is the original AirPress paper filter. Uh, just because I can't be bothered cutting uh, new ones out. Uh, the metal filter. Uh, I normally use the metal filter when I travel, because then I never run out of filters. So when I go to Colombia to Finca Tamana, for instance, we always brew AeroPress with uh, the metal filter. And I had some made for me uh, from SSV in Japan that I really like because uh, I can brew with the same method that I'm doing now, the, the original method, not the um, uh, upside down method. Uh, and the holes are, there are more holes in the middle than on the sides and that's to sort of compensate for the vortex you make when you stir. And you always get that little nipple of coffee in the or mountain of coffee in the in the middle, so it's easier to press down when you when you have a little bit more holes in the middle. All right, so and the water temperature. Water temperature. We normally in our store we use the Uber boiler, so we'll boost the Uber boiler. Uh, ninety six degrees is what we normally do, and that means we're getting around ninety three degrees in the actual AeroPress. So I'll put it on the scale. Uh, tear the scale, start the timer, and then 200 grams of water. Alright, 
Now in the beginning, uh, I normally stir just to get the, all the grounds wet. This stirring doesn't really affect the brewing that much. So it's not like if you stir three times or four times here, you'll get a huge difference in extraction. It's just to get all the grounds wet. Uh, they're more than busy enough degassing and the water is not really penetrating the grounds in the, in the beginning of the brew. Normally we brew for one minute and I forgot to put the stopwatch on so we just have to take it on our gut feeling now. But um, uh, normally we brew for one minute and then I'll take the, the cap off and stir. And that stirring will affect how much you extract a lot. So if I stir once, I will probably end up on an extraction on 18%. If I stir six times, I'll probably end up on an extraction on 22%. On the EK, uh, a lot of people don't realize that with an EK, because you have more even grounds, you need to extract more than on a grinder like this, for instance. This has a very uneven grind particle size, so some big ones and some small ones. So the small ones will be over-extracted easily and the big ones will be under-extracted e easily. So to avoid bitterness in a grinder like this, you need to extract less. That means coarser grinds and probably an extraction about 18 to 19 percent. With an EK, the grind sizes are much more even, so you can extract more without getting the bitterness because you don't have that many fines that will over-extract. So we'll typically end up between 21 and 22 percent on an air press sometimes more and sometimes a little bit less. Do you, any, do you have any thoughts on the inverted brewing with the AeroPress? You can do inverted uh, method on the AeroPress, that's uh, perfectly fine. Just make sure your uh, rubber gasket on the, on the plunger is, is clean and uh, also make sure you don't spill hot liquid all over your hands. That's the reason why we do this method in our bar, because it's much less risk of spilling and, and accidents. When I press, I normally just lean on it. I don't try to force it through, because then you get the coffee spraying all over and you get a lot of fines in the actual brew. So just lean on it, let it go naturally. It should take about 20 seconds, sometimes uh, 30 seconds. So you notice that I stirred at the end there. Um, Normally here we stir three times. I normally use the original AeroPress stirrer, which I think I don't have here. <laughs> so this is an Eva Solo stirrer, which is kind of nice, but uh, we try to streamline it here so all the baristas are doing the same. So it would be like, you put it down in the AeroPress, you do one stir, two stir, three stirs, and that's it. And if you do five stirs, you will extract a lot more than if you do two stirs, for instance. So it's, that's the important part uh, with the stirring at the end there, if you're stirring a lot or less. Of course you can adjust the grind size in order to get different extractions. Uh, and without the refractometer, it's a little bit difficult to, to know how to grind. So if you ask me how should I grind for a certain brew method, it's really difficult because every coffee needs slightly different grind size. For instance, with a V60, the more you brew, the coarser you need to grind. Um, but go by taste if you don't have a refractometer. I normally recommend starting somewhere. Let's say you start very fine, and then you go two steps coarser, and then two steps coarser again, and then you compare them in taste. If the coffee tastes thin, uh, it's really under-extracted. If it's thin and sour. And when you do this exercise, make sure you use the same amount of grams of coffee, the same amount of water. So we normally use 65 grams per liter as our standard. You can go up a little bit on the, the immersion and a little bit down on, on pour overs and, and drip methods. But 65 grams is our, our ballpark. So if you use the same amount of grams, same amount of water on your brew method, if your coffee is tasting a little thin and a little sour, try to adjust a little bit finer and you should get more sweetness so it balances the sourness. Because acidity is very easily extracted from coffee, but you need to also extract the sweetness and so on. If the coffee is too bitter and it feels a little thick, then you can adjust a little coarser. A lot of people think when the coffee is thin, when they use 65 grams per liter, they should use more coffee, but this actually is making the coffee taste worse. You, because you're using more uh, coffee, to the same amount of water, that means you're actually extracting less because you need a little bit of water to be able to extract from the coffee. And that just makes the coffee 
yeah, the, the TDS goes up, so it's stronger, but it's less extracted. So it will be sour, salty, and strong, and it's a very unpleasant flavor. So try to stick with the same amount of grounds and go fine or coarse, and then you can taste what you prefer. Normally, typically, if you're having a Brazil, which I find to be less soluble than, a, for instance, a Kenya or Ethiopia or, or even a Colombia, typically you will have to grind slightly finer when you're brewing a Brazil coffee than if you're brewing a Kenya, where we typically will grind a little bit coarser than the standard, which would be probably a Colombia or a, or a Honduran coffee would, would be in the middle. So they extract a little bit different. If you're unable to, if you're measuring your extraction, you're unable to extract enough even with the finest setting on the grinder. That means your roast is probably way off. Uh, so then you need to fix your roast. So normally we will pour this liquid into another jug, and that's just to make sure it's evenly mixed. Also to cool it down a little bit, because coffee doesn't taste great when it's steaming hot. It tastes much better when it's a little bit cooler. So I'm going to show you how the refractometer works. I have calibrated it, and what you do to calibrate it is to use distilled water, put it on the lens, you clean the lens of course, put the distilled water on the lens and there's a calibration method on, on the refractometer. Um, a lot of people think you can now just take the liquid and put it on the lens, but since this is uh, not filtered 100%, because on the filter holder you have some holes on the sides, you do get some undissolved solids in the liquid and that will disturb your reading. So with any brew method that is not filtered with like a, a Harry or like a drip method, uh, if you're brewing French press or espresso or um, aeropress, you need to filter the liquid before you measure. That's when you get the real measurements. Also I've found that the more liquid you run through these little syringe filters, the higher the TDS. So I use a standard. Uh, I normally take three millimeters, and there's a measurement on the actual syringe. Put the syringe filter on, filter it into a cup to cool down the liquid. The liquid needs to be the same temperature as the refractometer lens in order to read. Uh, correctly. So with this refractometer you can just put it on and after maybe 30 seconds uh, they will reach equilibrium so then you can get the correct reading. So if I start pressing now, not typically the number will be a little bit lower and then as I continue pressing the number will go up. So let's see. My TDS is now, oh, I don't have my phone but I have an iPad. Shall I zoom in? Maybe closer? Yeah, of course. So, my TDS reading is 1.50. And that's quite strong, especially for the Norwegian palettes. Now, I'm not sure. This is the app that comes with it. It's called Coffee Tools. And it's much cooler on an iPad or a, or a, and a Mac than on the iPhone because you get a little, uh, little graph here where you can see some lines and some dots, and that looks really cool. So the TDS is 1.50, that's the strength of the coffee. So that's how strong the coffee is. Of course, you can affect the strength by adding more coffee to the liquid, then the TDS will go up. But you might be under extracting that uh, coffee because you have more coffee to water ratio. So to get the TDS up with the same measurements, you will just have to grind finer. Um, so let's see, I'm on espresso mode now. I should be on coffee mode. And here there's a difference between drip and immersion. So Aeropress is immersion. And then I used 14 grams of coffee. My brew water was 200 grams and my TDS is 1.5. So 22.63, that's the extraction. 22%, 22.5%. So this will tell me that probably this coffee will taste slightly bitter. Then I can either grind coarser if I have a grinder, I can uh, stir one time less or I can have a little bit shorter brew time. The brew time does not have that massive effect, especially when we're brewing this fast. Even with the cupping, I've measured TDS after three minutes, after four minutes, after five minutes, after six minutes, 
the TDS is very, very close to each other. But the stirring really affects the, the TDS. So let's taste it. Because numbers is one thing, taste is a different thing. You always need to taste. If you don't taste it, you're never going to learn anything. It's definitely very sweet, but it also has this kind of dry bitterness in the end. A little drying on the tongue, tongue a little astringent. So that means I would probably go a little bit coarser for the next brew if I wanted to balance this brew a little bit. I wouldn't go uh, use less coffee because it's strong. I wouldn't use less coffee because that means if with the same grind size, same amount of water, you will actually over extract the coffee even more and you'll get even more bitter coffee. It's thin. And bitter and that's not what you want so if you want to learn about brewing you have to get a refractometer there's no way around it there's some videos on YouTube as well Matt Perger has some uh, nice videos on instructional videos on how to use it you can go to his web page just Google Matt Perger and you'll see his web page and it's uh, a lot of good material there if you want to read about it otherwise the coffee tasted uh, kind of good actually this, this particular coffee is a blend of uh, Validad Colombia, which is uh, early Castillo uh, development, and Catura. So it has that kind of little green herbalness that comes from the Validad Colombia, and that vibrant acidity and fruitiness from the Catura. So which model do you recommend to buy? The re refractometer. Get the one that measures both coffee and espresso, because if you are making espresso, uh, you will definitely use it for that as well, because that's a lot of fun. You'll learn a lot. And don't buy the smaller one. I don't even know if they're available, because uh, they're much more sensitive to temperature and you need to calibrate it all the time, and this is much more accurate. So um, you can have this for many, many years, so don't worry about the cost. It'll, it'll be a blessing when you get it. Uh, what's the name? The name, it's bought at the VST App Store, so VST Incorporated, he's the one who makes it, Vince Fidella. Um, he also sort of invented iTunes and, and uh, Firewire, so uh, he's kind of a genius, but he's uh, into coffee. So uh, he's the one who's making the VST filter baskets for the espresso machines um, and the refractometers. That's sort of his invention. All right, so... Aeropress, uh, yeah, you can use it in many different ways. I highly recommend just standardizing your brew method, playing more with the grind particle size. Uh, that's what we do in our bar. So when we get a new coffee, we'll test three or four different grind particle sizes and then we'll taste the coffee and we'll choose the best one based on measurements and also taste. Uh, if you start playing around with stirring and grind size and, you know, grams at the same time, you don't really know what affected the flavor of the cup. So try to just start at a basic point and, and test that, different grind size for instance. And then if you still feel like the coffee is thin, even if you're extracting very much, um, extracting a lot, sorry, uh, then you can of course add some more coffee and extract a little bit less if you want a stronger cup. But uh, try to do change only one thing at a time and always taste the cups side by side. It's a little bit difficult to taste cups side by side, so I highly recommend getting a, a laser thermometer because you need to taste the coffee at the same temperature. So typically, I'll, I'll, if I brew two cups, I'll either preheat this cup and pour the first brew into that, and I'll pour probably up to there. And on the second cup, I won't have a preheated cup, and I'll pour a little bit less. And then I'll stir so that they're the same temperature. And then I'll start tasting because if this cup would be, uh, let's say, 40 degrees and this cup would be 60 degrees, the balance of the coffee will be totally different just based on the temperature. So you need to make sure you're tasting at the same temperature. A little technical, but uh, it'll help you understand brewing a lot more. You want some? <laughs> ah, yeah. Thanks. And someone asked uh, when the Kenyan will be available. Probably the beans. Ooh, so the Kenyans this year, uh, our shipment is a little bit delayed, so it will be available at the end of May. Uh, I have to get it available before June, because in June I'm getting married and then I'm going on a honeymoon, so who's going to roast the trials then? I don't know, but well, it will be for sure uh, at the beginning of June it will be available. We're also launching a new Ethiopian coffee from Cooperative Nano Chala within the next two weeks, and... 
uh, we just uh, received some Castillo from uh, Tamama, so that's the first time we actually have Castillo from this farm. And I did a trial on Monday uh, and also today, uh, but I wasn't really happy with any of those roasts. I haven't. I just tasted it briefly, but I could tell that uh, it wasn't a good roast. So we'll probably do some more trials on that next week, and in two weeks that will probably be out in the shop as well. So then we'll sell both the blend of Caturra and Valle of Colombia, and then the Castillo separately. So you can taste both side by side, and then you can make an opinion if Castillo really is bad. I don't think so. They're all getting hyped and uh, congratulations and congrats to some Norwegian Russians. <laughs> nice. <laughs> all right, so let's brew a Hario brew. There's a lot of these filter holders, you know, and uh, as I said, the shape is different. The actual paper filter will be different. I actually did a, an event in Korea uh, two years ago where I was brewing with a Wilfa brewer and then someone had given me two different filters and with the same grind size uh, one of them took six minutes to brew and the other one took three minutes to brew uh, so the the tolerance of the filter is very different so the how much it will filter so that's affecting the brew a lot uh, the actual shape of the filter holder and you know I'm not so concerned about so whatever you don't need more than one just make sure you learn how to use the one you have. That's what's most important. Um, rinse the paper filter. I always use uh, hot water. You can use hot water from the sink. You don't need to boil a lot of water to use this, but uh, hot water because then I preheat the actual filter holder as well. And that makes the brewing temperature a little bit more even. Um, of course, when you brew like this and you pour water into it, you'll lose a lot of temperature. So you're never going to have a completely stable brew temp, even if you're using a Bonavita kettle with a PID thermostat that keeps the, the, the water that comes out of the kettle at the same temperature, you'll lose a lot of temperature once you hit the coffee. Uh, and that's just the way it is. It doesn't mean you're not able to make the coffee taste great, because you are. This is a very easy way to make coffee. Uh, this is the normal way I make coffee at home if I'm brewing for more than one person. Uh, or if it's like Sunday and I need uh, half a liter of coffee to just to wake up, uh, I'll, I'll brew on a Hario or a Kono or a Kalita or whatever, whatever I have in my in my cupboard. So you, you like them all? Yeah, I like them all. I mean, uh, normally I would just use the same one for a certain period of time, so I just learn to use it with my grinder, so I don't have to think when I brew. Uh, but I know I can make good coffee on any brewing device. The Chemex I struggle with, I, I love the design, but it, it's so slow and I'm a very impatient guy, so that's kind of the reason why I don't love the Chemex. Uh, but of course you can brew great coffee on the Chemex as well. Alright, so coffee. I said on this method we use a little bit less coffee, so on the AeroPress I use 70 grams per liter. On this device I'm going to use uh, 65 grams per liter and I'm brewing half a liter so that means 32 and a half grams. Very easy. I mean that half gram, probably not the most crucial part, but uh, about, about 32 grams. So we're going to brew the Nascimento. Of course you're not going to be able to taste it, but uh, I just want to taste it. So going a little bit coarser on the grind. Uh, I haven't actually brewed V60 with this grinder in a while, so I don't remember exactly where to grind. So I'll just start start a place and then see how it goes. Let's start on here. So I'm grinding on 13 on this dial. That would be probably uh, 7 and probably around 7 on the original dial on the EK. Um, the grounds should probably feel more like, a, like white sugar or something. Let's just grind straight into the... Does the water get less soluble? What's the name? Like, in the bottom than compared to the top? Sol soluble? What do you mean? Uh, yeah, could you clarify? Uh, the Please one clarify. The question? <laughs> Let me just uh, say this first. Uh, with, with the EK grinder, uh, you have this shaking device. It'll shake the, the grounds and you notice there's a lot of chaff that comes out, this white stuff. And you'll get a lot of this on, on washed coffees. That's just a silver skin. Uh, we call it chaff after it's roasted. Um, but this tastes kind of like a hay, like a dried straw or something like that. So um, 
a lot of times people prefer not to, to add it. Of course, you will always get some of it into the brew, but the less you have, the, the more clear you'll, you'll get the flavor. You can use, uh, if you're really anal about it, you can use a, a sieve that takes about, uh, let's see, uh, one, what's the size? I, I don't remember the size, but kind of a coarse sieve that takes out the, the biggest particles, the boulders, and, and also the, the chaff. So this is faster than the Chemex? This is definitely faster than the Chemex, <laughs> uh, unless you're really slow at brewing. So, I'm going to use water, uh, the water temperature here, it's 96 degrees what we get out of the Uber boiler. Uh, I'm just going to preheat the pouring kettle a little bit, so I get it up to temperature. Normally I recommend using uh, these kettles on, on uh, induction because you get it up to a boil really fast and uh, you, you heat the kettle while you're heating the water. It's a very efficient way of uh, heating it. So if you're not in a coffee shop or something and you have an induction oven, uh, these kettles are great. I think you can use both the Hario and the Bonavita on the induction. Alright, so normally now we will start a timer. Uh, let's see if we have a timer. We do it here. And then people, will, we had 32 grams in, and then I'll add probably twice the amount for the bloom. That's what normal people do. Uh, well, that's normally what people do. I'm sorry, my <laughs> voice is really bad. So about 64 grams. Okay, a lot of people like to stir now. Uh, I don't particularly do it, and I'm also not so concerned about this blooming time. So. Whatever you do, just make sure you do it the same way all the time, and then adjust the grind accordingly. The blooming part is really uh, to get all the grounds wet and so on, but they will get wet anyway during brewing. So uh, I found that I, I can't really taste a huge difference whether I bloom or not, uh, as long as I brew the same way all the time and then adjust the grind accordingly. Beautiful bloom. <laughs> wow, such a bloom. And um, I'm not following any any particular order right now. Now I'm just brewing like I would do at home, actually. I'm not very uh, particular when I brew at home. I'll just try to... Oh, I forgot to start the timer again. I'll try to brew, pour the water uh, the same amount of times. Because if, if you film close here, you'll see every time I pour water, I also stir the coffee, so you'll have some turbulence and uh, what we call agitation or stirring whenever you pour water. So if you pour, let's say, a hundred times, you'll of course stir a lot more than if you just pour three times. Um, so try to be a little uh, strict about how you pour and it'll be much easier to be consistent in your brewing. You know, it's it's not the end of the world if you if you missed it by a second or something. I'm sure the coffee will taste great. If you have the grind setting pretty well dialed in, if you have a good uh, coffee beans and your water quality is great, you have clean equipment and so on, and correct measurements. Um, so, you know, we don't need to be that focused on every single detail when we brew. Try to appreciate uh, coffee for what it is as well. It's just coffee and water. You know, it's not uh, <laughs> the end of the world if you miss it. So what uh, happens in the bloom? So what happens in the bloom, when, when you pour hot water on coffee, and especially if the coffee is freshly roasted, you'll see that it starts to sort of bubble in it. There's a lot of CO2 gas, carbon dioxide, trapped inside the coffee beans. And once you put water on that, uh, it will start evaporating. So you'll get a lot of bubbles and so on. So people, the theory behind blooming is that you'll, you'll sort of wet the grounds before you start brew, uh, brewing properly uh, so that all the grounds are wet and you have a more even extraction. So what about the color change? Does it matter? What do you mean color change? Like a varying color, someone asked. Uh, well, the color it depends the on, on different things. So with this method, you're actually brewing by gravity. So we're pouring water that is sort of extracting the coffee and filtering it out. So the, the color of the water will be lighter and lighter as you go, but also the color of the water or the coffee will be, of course, directly depending on the roast degree. So a lighter roast will give you a lighter color, a darker roast will give you a darker color, and so on. 
So I'm trying to hit 500 grams. And if you if you look at a very precise uh, scale, you'll see okay I pour it into 500 grams and now it's already 499 grams 0.8. And the reason for this is evaporation. I posted this on Instagram some months ago uh, with the Akaya scale, which is a really good and precise home uh, scale for home brewers that you can. Um, you can use with your iPhone or iPad and I'll tell you gram, grams, you can, you'll also see the grams on the actual scale and people would say that since I didn't put uh, isolation between the, the jug and the scale the heat from the jug will affect how the load cell in the scale reads the, the grams and that might be true but that was not the case there so I put I put uh, I think uh, this thick uh, wood in between the jug and the scale and the same thing happened. So it's actually evaporation. Uh, the water is evaporating so you're losing a couple of grams. Now we're on 498.9 grams. But the water on top does extract more? The water on top does extract more? No, I don't think so. Um, I don't think so. I don't know. You will have to ask a professor of uh, water extraction, uh, coffee extraction. Ask Matt Perger, that's better. Um, I'm not very concerned about this evaporation. Uh, normally I will just use the, the, the brew water that I actually poured into the coffee as the measurement that I use in the app. But if you really want to have a 100% precise reading on extraction, you should actually weigh the final brew and then compare that to how much coffee you put in and then put it into the app and then you'll get a much more precise number on extraction. What about the pulse pouring? Pulse pouring is... The reason why we do pouring and not pour everything at once is to get a more even extraction. So you'll see that if you put all the, the water in at once, of course the gravity and the force will... the water will be forced through the coffee a lot faster. Um, and also the filter would be overflow, uh, but also you, you'll get a little bit more even extraction. You, I'll, you'll see, for instance, if you use a coffee brewer, a lot of times the pouring will only be in the middle. And so the, the grounds on the sides will not get wet at the same time. So then I would actually just use a spoon and just stir so that everything gets wet at the same time. All right, let's look at this now because it's still dripping a little bit. A lot of people think that you know the last bit it's only water so we don't need that but you do need that in order to balance the brew so the first drops that comes out of this when you start brewing is extremely concentrated and very salty and it tastes almost like salty licorice so in order to balance that uh, in your final cup you need to have the the thin water that the, it looks like water the last drops that comes out of a, a filter like this you need that to balance the concentrated one so that the brew is more sort of even. So, all right. One thing to remember when you brew filter coffee, and just because the last drops are much less concentrated than the first drops, you need to stir the brew before you serve it. Otherwise, the first cup will be slightly lower tedious than the last one. Do you keep the water level topped when you brew? You think it? Uh, depends on how much I brew actually. So if I would brew a liter on this, I would pour a lot more water in at the same time. What about people using like really low temp temperatures with the AeroPress in like championships? Yeah, I've I've tasted good. I've tasted great brews with temperatures down to 80 degrees. Uh, I find them to be slightly more one-dimensional. Um, but uh, it really depends on the roast. If the roast is slightly off, it might taste a lot better with colder temperature because you're not extracting everything. Uh, Jeff Verellen, who is I think three times uh, world AeroPress champion, he has been using a very low uh, water temperature with success, obviously. But uh, it really depends. So I'm not uh, afraid of experimenting with lower temperatures. I don't think that coffee has to be brewed at you know 94 degrees because we're brewing with uh, 93 degrees in the espresso. Uh, with this, probably the brew temperature is below 90, and it's still tasting really good. So I, I wouldn't be, be too concerned about uh, the exact number there. But uh, I found that you know brewing on less than 80, then you start to get these really malty flavors, like uh, a malt whiskey, 
and you lose out on some of the fruit and the vibrant acidity in the coffee. So it, it be, just becomes a little bit more sour. But you are able to extract a lot from the coffee with cold water. So um, is it a good a good idea to like uh, um, like after we were done with the V60, like you squeeze the filter? You can do that if you want to. I don't do it personally, um, just because I want to get it even the same result every time. And if you squeeze, it depends on how much you squeeze and and so on. But uh, you're welcome to do it. I think if it makes your coffee taste better, then why not do it? Uh, what am I looking for? I'm I'm gonna show you how to measure the filter coffee because now there's no fines in this liquid, so we don't really need to filter it with the the syringe and the syringe filter. I don't reuse this actually because uh, they tend to just have a higher reading if you do. So what I'll do is just take some liquid into a cup and make sure I cool it down. That's done really fast if you do it like this. You get the refractometer, put it on, And then you'll see if I push straight away, you'll get a lower reading and then it'll go up a little bit. So 152, this is probably a very strong brew, 153 and so on. So when it stabilizes, that means the lens and the liquid is, has reached the same temperature. And that's when you get the correct reading. Does, the ma uh, does it matter if the, the coffee bed is completely flat after brewing? After brewing, well, there's a trick there. Uh, after brewing, obviously, if you're grinding extremely fine, you'll see like... Uh, mines being dug by the water through the coffee and that's not a good thing if the coffee if the bed is a little uneven on top it's not the end of the world because you can easily make it evenly just by shaking it after your last pour just shake the filter a little bit and everything will settle very flat so uh, you know I'm not too concerned about that um, your, your thoughts on like espresso brewed coffee americano pardon like uh, do you enjoy an Americano? Uh, Maybe I, compared to this... Uh, this I method. actually don't enjoy Americanos as much as I do filter coffees. I just think I've had them so many times and uh, I as, and always get this kind of dirty poly filter taste. Even if the poly filter is, uh, is clean, I always get that reminiscent of dirty poly filter taste in Americanos. Also in coffee shots, I've had some great coffee shots, but uh, you still have that kind of finish that uh, hasn't been great. That's partly because of roasting, of course, um, but I do tend to find that filter coffees are much easier to, to brew, uh, and it's more forgiving, I, I would say, in terms of making it taste great. Uh, I did have one Americano at Coffee Collective once that was kind of interesting. They, they brewed an espresso on a very light roasted coffee, uh, and then skim the foam of the Americano before they served it. And that actually tasted pretty good. So you should never say never. Um, 157. So we need to change the drip. Uh, the TDS is 1.57. The dose was 32 grams. And the brew water was 500 grams. So it's almost the same extraction with this a uh, little bit higher TDS. Than the previous one. Let's Do you see. have a favorite like a hand grinder? Someone uh, asked if you have tried the Lido too. No, I the hand grinders that I've tried is uh, I've tried the Hario, the old Sassen House grinders, of course. Uh, normally, I will travel with the Porlex because it fits in perfectly into the into the handle of the AeroPress, and I always travel very light, so I try to keep everything very compressed. But if I'm going, if I have a checked in luggage, I will always bring my Commandante because it grinds more evenly than the Porlex, but it's a little bit more heavy and a little bigger. Uh, so I normally don't bring that on, on short trips or trips where I only have my hand luggage. Do you have any tips on like uh, cold brewing? Tips on cold brewing? Don't do it. That's my tips. <laughs> <laughs> I actually really dislike uh, cold brewed coffee. Um, uh, there's nothing wrong with liking it, I just really dislike it myself, so I, I, I tend not to brew it a lot. I've been testing a little bit, but I always tend to get this very malty, uh, sort of heavy malt whiskey flavor that I really dislike, and I find that most of the coffees taste very similar. Uh, it's like almost like when you roast them too dark, 
Uh, so you lose that sort of vibrancy in the coffees that I really like. So we, when we make cold coffees, we normally brew hot and cool it down. And I'll brew like I did the Hario here and maybe add a little sugar just to keep the bitterness down and just to boost that sort of fruitiness in, in the cup. I'm working on some uh, new methods, but uh, I'm not going to tell you anything until uh, I succeed with uh, doing it. Otherwise, you know, I might uh, mislead you. Hmm. That was a very nice cup, actually. Uh, even though it was a uh, high extraction, the Hario makes the coffee taste cleaner. Of course, the mouthfeel is cleaner because you always have some sediment in the in the in the aeropress. Um, so there's a little bit more clarity in a Hario. The reason why we don't use it in our shop is because of speed. So we prefer to be able to brew single cups much faster uh, and we, we feel that we can do that with the aeropress faster than, than with the, the Hario. What about like pouring over ice? Pouring over ice is also good but if you're using um, if you're brewing hot coffee then pouring it over ice you need to calculate the water in the ice so measure how much ice you're using and calculate that in your brewing. From memory I think uh, the VST Coffee Tools app has a iced coffee uh, mode where you can measure this. Um, but I tend to brew a stronger um, cup, so more coffee to water ratio when I brew. Uh, that it has a good extraction, of course, and then you dilute it with uh, with the ice. So it's almost like making an Americano. It's just you're using ice instead of water, which is water just in a different form. All right, so I think uh, we'll uh, quit around there. We've talked about the equipment, the importance of that. Uh, I feel that, uh, yeah, you'll get slightly different cup qualities with different brewing methods because of the filters. But make sure you learn how to use your brewing device and make sure it's clean, and I'm sure you'll get good results almost regardless. We talked about grind size, so if you're using the same measurements, which I highly recommend. Try to go for like between 60 to 70 grams per liter when you brew coffees like this. Slightly more with immersion methods like French press, Aeropress, uh, Kuki Kaffe in Norwegian. Uh, slightly less coffee with uh, a drip method. Um, use the same measurements, coffee to water ratio, and play with the grind size. That's how you sort of play with the strength and the extraction. So. Finer grinds, of course, you will get a little bit stronger coffee, but also more extraction. Uh, coarser grind, uh, weaker coffee, but also less extraction. And it shouldn't be sour, it should be balanced and sweet. Uh, we talked about the ingredients, so you can never make good coffee without good ingredients. And even if you think you have a great coffee, try other coffees as well. I mean, I am the first to recommend people to buy other coffees than my coffees, because I think the more coffees you taste, the more reference you will have, and then it's much easier to evaluate whether you're buying a good coffee or not. So uh, I highly recommend trying many coffees, but if you're going to learn about brewing, try to use the same coffee for a certain period of time so you get to know the ins and outs of different brewing things, like what does the grind size do with the extraction, what does the stirring do, and so on. And of course the water, uh, Maxwell Colonna is the guy to watch out for, he, uh, he has some lectures online, uh, we'll put out the links, very very interesting stuff. The problem is, uh, yeah we know this now, but so what, we cannot find the perfect filters to, to design the water we want so far. So with your local water you really need to find a, a roaster that is testing his coffees on his local water, so they, they taste good at your community. because. Our water is extremely soft here and we roast for our water and it will taste very different in another country. I think that's it. Uh, on the 29th of May uh, mm. we'll be playing a little bit uh, around with Espresso on Periscope. Uh, talking about VST filters, extraction again, we'll probably use the refractometer a little bit. And yeah, just playing around with the Espresso machine. Uh, I try to keep this less scientific and a little bit more fun so that not only professionals and people who know a lot about coffee can watch, but also people who want to learn the basics. So, yeah, thanks for watching. There, there's always some questions like uh, people, 
didn't get an answer, so they maybe should tweet us. Or yeah, if you have any unanswered uh, questions, please tweet us, and we'll try to answer them. And you know, I don't know everything about coffee. Uh, there's a lot more to learn for me as well. And my focus these days is not necessarily so much on brewing; it's more on farming and and so on. So. Uh, I highly recommend uh, subscribing to Matt Berger's uh, Barista Hustle, uh, although I don't necessarily agree with every single thing he writes. Uh, it's a really good resource for learning the ins and outs of, of extraction and brewing. He's a very, very talented barista that writes a lot about brewing coffee. So if you want to learn more about that, Matt Berger Barista Hustle, and also check out his website which I think is called mattberger.com or something. Uh, there's a lot of nice tutorials there. So yeah, that's my recommendation. Thanks for watching. See you on the 29th of May.